On the coast of Massachusetts, a ferry sails into a quiet cove. Commuters come home to the small town of Hingham. Few of them know that this was the site of a massive undertaking that helped turn the tide of World War II. You wonder how it will be remembered, how people will know the contribution that was made here. Inside this massive building, thousands worked day and night to build great warships. Real fact of the matter, you felt good about the fact that if you put in a good day's work, you might be saving a guy's life. Nearby are the remains of 16 concrete bays where workers assembled the ships. Few of them had ever built a ship before, but they launched over 200 in record time. The ships that went out of here, they said were the best ships that anybody had built anywhere. Eleanor Roosevelt once said that Main Street in Hingham was the prettiest street in America. Before the Second World War, Hingham was much smaller than it is today. I would say there was anywhere 15 to maybe 20 working farms in Hingham. Stan Hersey can trace his family's history in Hingham back to 1635. Our farm, the Hersey farm on Hersey Street, was my great-great-grandfather, Reuben. Hingham had probably 4,000 people. Everybody knew everybody. Peg Charlton moved to Hingham at the age of two. In 1939, she was 17 years old. The town was so much smaller then. You lived on your particular street, particularly if you'd lived there a good part of your life. You knew everyone on the street. In the spring of 1940, the war seemed a million miles away. But in June, the world began to crumble. Germany occupied France. Nazi U-boats sank hundreds of British ships. The number of sinkings was tremendous. It was catastrophic at times. I mean, they lost half the shipping. Some of the convoys were decimated. To Ian Menzies, a young British naval officer, the outlook was dire. If that volume of sinking kept up, Britain couldn't have carried on. I mean, no matter how much they wanted to fight, they had to have the supplies. To keep England alive, the US offered to lend its ships. It seemed like the only way to avoid another war in Europe. See, because it was just 25 years since the First World War, we were over there. If we can give all our allies all this material, we won't have to send uh, our boys over there, and we won't have to go over and help them again. But the U.S. fleet was small and outmoded. Most ships were remnants from World War I. The Navy began designing a new ship, the Destroyer Escort. And it commissioned Bethlehem Steel to be the major contractor. But Bethlehem shipyards were already working at full capacity. A new shipyard would have to be built from the ground up. A site was found on the Massachusetts coast in the tiny town of Ham. It had a deep harbor and few existing buildings. Life in Hingham was about to change. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. 
I think that we were so totally stunned by the attack on Pearl Harbor. I don't think people really had a chance to be afraid. They were just mad. Within weeks of the attack, a survey party arrived in Hingham. Joe Landry was 19 years old. It was his first real job. Well, I was a member of a survey party. I was probably one of a handful of the first people that arrived at this site to build a shipyard. The construction team would have to build a shipyard at lightning speed. Immediately, crews began working around the clock to clear 150 acres. They tore down buildings like Don Rand's Dude Ranch and a restaurant known as Jimmy La Hood's. I happened to be there the day they shut it down. And they gave Jimmy La Hood about 15 minutes warning that the dishes and utensils for the lunch and meal were on the table. He wasn't allowed to take anything. After the land was cleared, workers erected the skeleton of a steel mill. It stretched more than a third of a mile. The workers built wooden cradles to house each ship and brought in over a dozen giant cranes. Before they were done, the Navy had spent the equivalent of $250 million. This was overnight, and in a few short months, they constructed an entire shipyard. The shipyard needed thousands of workers to build a single ship, but most men over the age of 18 were going off to war. The ships would have to be built by boys too young to fight, like Bill Copeland. Well, I was 16 years old. The shipyard needed workers, and I needed the money. So I started working the uh, three, to, 3 to 11 shift. And by men who were injured and couldn't fight, like Dan Henderson. I was a poor rep. I was approximately 20 years of age when I first went to work down there. Some men hadn't worked in years because of the Depression. People come out of office jobs. People come off of, uh, come off of beds to go to work down there. They, they had no jobs and probably hadn't had them for eight, 10 years. But that type of guy is a guy who built a ship. In order to turn these men into shipbuilders, Bethlehem imported a team of 400 veteran workers. Charles Downey moved from apprentice to team leader in a year. And of course you progress very quickly. And I had up to 15 people reporting through me and, and taking work assignments from me. I really uh, am, am shocked to think about the awesome responsibility that young people had in the shipyard. In less than a year, there were over 15,000 workers in the yard. Things were moving at a frenetic pace. It was really so intense and so concentrated. Organized chaos, really, because they knew if you were coming in as a stranger, it, it was terrifying almost. You know, things were swinging over your head, huge tons of uh, steel. They'd pick up a steel plate and zoom one into the other of it. It was almost like a train going overhead. It would be like ants just running around. Everybody was running around. Everybody seemed to know their job. If they didn't, they found out. But as more and more men went to war, the labor shortage intensified. 
So like other factories across America, the shipyard began hiring the only workers left, women. Every day they were taking a train load of uh, fellows yeah. to go to war, a lot of them, a lot of them. So you figured there wasn't... Uh, there was no manpower, there was, it was all woman yeah. power. Yeah. yeah. The Hingham shipyard began an active program to recruit women. Mary Fisher was only 16 years old when she signed up. I was 5'3 then, yeah, and I only weighed like 110 pounds. But okay. I lived in East Boston, and I lived in a tough neighborhood, so I was tough from day one. I didn't have to work in a shipyard to be tough. Mary trained to become a welder. It was intense work. When you worked in the steel mill, it was like bedlam. Oh, the noise was unbelievable. The first day I worked in the shipyard, I had the biggest headache anybody ever had in the world. Fran Catrapone quit her job in a shoe factory to join the lady welders. And you know, we, we'd have to wear these jackets that were, they were suede, suede, but they were heavy. And you know, you could be welding overhead, and even though you had that jacket on, you'd end up with some pretty good burns you know where. <laughs> pretty good no, burns. No. I bet a lot of women have got scars from that. Soon, over 2,500 women were punching the clock. I went shopping one day in Fillane's, and I, my girlfriend and I, and we were dressed in our welding outfits. You know, the women in there looked down on us. Oh, yeah, like, they, they did. Oh, like we were trash. And I said, excuse me, we're saving your country you don't mind. But the problem was how to churn out ships faster than ever before. Fighting ships were highly complex machines and were made one at a time, piece by piece. The engineers needed to simplify the process so it could be done quickly by inexperienced workers. So they invented a system of mass production in which many ships could be built at the same time. Sheets of steel were cut using patterns, creating hundreds of individual parts. Each part was given a number, and like a giant jigsaw puzzle, the parts would be assembled into large sections. You weren't building these ships by just plate by plate. They'd build certain sections of the ship and just bring it out of the steel mill and place it on board. First, the sections were laid one next to another. Then the welders fused them together. Next, the crane operators lowered the upper sections in place. Within days, workers built the entire ship from the ground up. The process was repeated on ship after ship. I mean, here were 16 boats, all in separate slips, being built at the same time. By now, there were 23,000 workers in the yard. Only from the air could the magnitude of the operation be seen. On the ground, the shipyard was getting into high gear. They were days that flew by because you were so busy you had no, no time to think of anything else. You were working six, maybe seven days a week. There were three shifts, eight hours a day. A standard work week was 48 hours, six days. And then we would work Sunday if, if, we, if they wanted us to. Yeah. Like if they needed extra help, you could because on Sundays you got double time. After a decade of the Depression, people suddenly found themselves with money. The money uh, was, was excellent. It was far, far better than the 35 cent an hour job I had at the AMP. So 98 cents sounded like a lot of money to us. On Friday, hundreds of workers lined up to cash their paychecks at the Hingham Trust. It, which, it was just mayhem, you know. Here they've got this wonderful paycheck. It's Friday, 
and every all of them are just all kind of you know holiday mood all of them are kind of jostling around sometimes it was a problem to you to get up so late that the banks were closed anyway but many of the barons around there would uh, would they would bring money in knowing full well that if a guy came in with a check and he didn't have any money with him he uh, he would drink one drink and leave on Friday and Saturday nights, hundreds of young sailors descended on Hingham Square for a night out. Many would go to the Servicemen's Recreation Center in Hingham. Mary McClellan was a hostess at the rec center. She was 17 years old. It was Friday nights that we went to the rec center. We actually had a lot of fun there, we really did. Uh, the, the boys were our age, we were all young people. We had music and dancing and refreshments, and you really look forward to going, and I know, I know they did too. In less than two years, Hingham had transformed itself into one of the largest shipbuilding centers in the entire country. Workers were pounding out ships at a rate of over six a month. Each one was a cause for celebration. Anne Collins was the daughter-in-law of William H. Collins, the shipyard's first general manager. Uh, quite a sight to see a ship in its cradle, and then they start knocking on, out the underpinnings of the cradle. First of all, they knocked the, uh, the shores off. Cut one. And then he said, cut two, cut three, cut four, until there was one left. And I was swinging one of the hammers. I said, we'll never get this damn thing off the ground. I know we won't. But sure as God made little green apples, when he cut that last one, she swung the bottle, and down the ways went the thousands and thousands of ton ship. It would start to quiver, and then it would become alive and it suddenly was a, it was a being, more or less. It went slowly, 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 and then it picked up speed as it went down the ways. Nobody advised these people that uh, this ship would displace tons and tons of water. And when it slid down the waves and hit that water and pushed a tremendous wave across, and that wave would only, it, it, it couldn't expend itself on the, uh, on the beach on the other side, so it would come back again. And these people who were coming down to, to watch the launching would run down, down the waves on the ground. And this way of coming back would catch them. There'd be people flying. There'd be everybody soaking wet and, uh, and whatnot. The Navy pushed Hingham hard, demanding 60 destroyer escorts in 1943 alone. But the shipyard ground out 90. Fifty percent more than the Navy had thought possible. In August, the Navy recognized the shipyard's hard work. It awarded Hingham with an E for excellence, an honor that was once reserved for sailors in action. I remember the yard receiving an E for excellence, and I remember the presentation that went with it. It went in and on in the mill, and I think it was the first time the mill was ever quiet. On the day of the ceremony, work stopped for one of the few times in the history of the shipyard. But for the shipyard, the true test would be at sea. British sailors came to board their ships. Among them was Ian Menzies. We were concerned a little as to how they would react in the sea, you know, in, in the trials. 
would they live up to their speeds? They could do 24 knots, which was pretty good. Um, and, but how would they react in a storm? Escorting the convoys across the Atlantic could be a punishing trip. The weather didn't raise havoc with a small ship and all aspects and refueling at sea and stuff like that. Ed Goldrick sailed on a Hingham May DE. The weather was so bad, there was maybe 25 or 30 ships in the convoy, and you went up, up on deck, and you could only see one at a time. That's how, how bad the weather would be. Lots of times, you wouldn't even be able to go above decks, right? It was so rough, the water was washing over it all the time, because you're uh, only a few feet off the water. You're only but I think about 30 foot wide and 205, 210 foot long, so it was, it was almost like a canoe out in the big ocean. But the destroyer escorts survived in the most difficult conditions. Our people are sort of watching to see how it reacts. Uh, it was, the weather was so bad, they were all ill practically. But it did beautifully, the ship itself was very seaworthy, and I had been in two other destroyers, and I would say that um, the DEs were just as good as uh, any of them. The destroyer escorts guarded hundreds of convoys across the Atlantic. On each one, they faced the threat of submarine attack. Several Hingham ships sank U-boats in battle including the Bates and Ian Menzies' ship, the Stainer. By late 1943, the fight against the U-boats was largely won. But to win the war, the Allies would have to land in Europe. Blocking the way was the heavily fortified French coast. With conventional ships, a beach landing was impossible. The Allied plan was to crash land on the beaches with a fleet of flat-bottomed ships. Hingham was flooded with orders for new ships. The largest of these could carry 10 tanks and equipment, or 1,000 men. It was called the Landing Ship Tank, or LST. Bill Copeland left the shipyard to serve on one of the first LSTs. When I was assigned to Little Creek, Virginia, I didn't have any idea what an, M what an LST was. And as we took the ferry across the bay and looked at these, monstrosities as we thought about them in those days. We're going to sail on one of those things, but we came to love it. We really did. The way an LST was built with their paper-thin steel hulls and so forth, you wondered whether they would withstand the tremendous poundings that the ocean was giving them. When we were in a typhoon uh, headed up towards Okinawa, and uh, as the old flat-bottomed LST would lift up out of the waves and come cracking down, I and probably every single member of our ship said, boy, I hope those lady welders did their job well. On June 6, 1944, D-Day, thousands of flat-bottomed ships landed on the coast of France. In the months following, other crucial landings would take place on beaches in the Pacific. Together, the landings helped turn the tide of the war. In Hingham, another ship slid into the harbor. It was the 227th to be constructed at the shipyard. All in all, 227 ships were built in three and a half years in the Beth Hingham shipyard. A wonderful record. I think it's wonderful. 
it's very exciting and, and not any other shipyard did it. Work on the 16 slips came to a halt. The steel mill was quiet. The last workers were laid off. For many, it was a bittersweet moment. We really didn't want to leave. We would have stayed on forever, I think. I know, yeah. I, I really liked it. I don't know what it was. It was something about it. You felt like you accomplished something. Randy and I have been the greatest friends since then. And well, we're sister-in-law, so we're going to be. Now we're related anyway, but I mean, but we we're, we're always good friends, mm. yeah. In Hingham, there was a vacuum where the war had been. It was an eerie kind of feeling. It was sort of like time stood still. It was kind of like a ghost town almost. It just, it was as though everyone just sort of collapsed for a minute and got their breath and then said, well, where do we go from here? More than anything, people wanted to get on with their lives. Once I got home, I'd say, well, I've got a lot of makeup. I didn't have those years I missed, you know? I want to get married. I want to have a home. We had to have children. We had to get a job. You know, we, we had to get settled. Uh, you know, we had to build back, build America, and, and, and do things that we, we, we missed that we didn't do. That was how I think everyone felt. They just wanted to get on with their lives and, and start a career of whatever. Some people who had worked in the yard settled down in Hingham. Ian Menzies came back to town to marry a local girl. Ann Collins and her husband moved into a house on South Street. Stan Hersey came home to the family farm and for a while had a job building homes for young families. I worked on the Smith uh, Road and Butler Road development uh, right after the war, building these little Cape Cod, four and a half rooms, unfinished upstairs, $9,800. $9, it was years before people came to realize the importance of work done on the home front and how ships built at home helped make victory possible overseas. And we began to wonder how small towns like Hingham could have done so much in so short a time. At the time, I don't think we thought about it. We just wanted to make sure that uh, we did everything we could for the war effort, and we wanted to win. I just know that I was proud to be sailing on a vessel that was built by my neighbors here in Hingham, Massachusetts. I really don't know what else I can I say other than I'm, I'm just so happy to, to have been part of it. Yep, and I thank you so much to tell the story. <laughs> Thank you.